Let's uh, start with a bit of context that these books really emerge out of my uh, interest in doing tours uh, for Phil and Fubble, the West Belfast Festival. I started off many, many years ago uh, doing a bus tour of West Belfast, then in the process of that uh, would have uh, got into the cemeteries to do a few graves and then that progressed to a walking tour. In fact, back in my younger days it was like six hours and I did two cemeteries together. Um, what I was trying to demonstrate is the complex, layered, great but difficult history of our city. And you see it in the headstones. Um, you, it, you know, one of the things I, uh, you know, becomes quite clear when you do uh, walk through a cemetery is that history doesn't run along parallel lines, crisscrosses. It's complex. It's layered, and you see that on the headstones. So then I started to do walking tours, and people would say, "Have you put that down on paper?" And so I started to write it down, and then I would. Uh, Eventually, I brought in a book on the city cemetery. So today is really uh, the culmination of, I suppose, years of, of experience and how I, my journey, has developed in terms of how I approach the writing of a book. I'm not going to talk about the actual writing, but I want to talk about how I collect this information and what I think is important. Uh, in a way, when you begin to uh, research cemeteries, it's always important to keep names in your head to be able to associate. Because as you read and you research, uh, you'll come across names. And then my theory of history is you always find what you're not looking for. So you need to find a way of actually storing information that you don't need, but that later on you can bring into your narrative. So I want to talk about the fundamentals for me of, of uh, my approach today, which of course is more organized, is more uh, systematic, uh, uh, and I have a very deliberate uh, approach now uh, in writing when I come to a burial ground, and hopefully my next uh, book is going to be on one of Belfast's oldest graveyards, Clifton Street. And so I was there yesterday morning at quarter to seven, to get the light which shines at a particular stone. Because one thing you learn when you research graveyards is that there are days when it rains and you can read, there are days when it's sunshine and you can read a stone. You get to know all these ways of photographing headstones. So uh, let me start. Where do we begin? Well, for me now, it's creating a structure of storing information. Before I start, I now have a structure. Uh, and that structure is to create a reference system which allows me to tap into the information in an easy and accessible way. And so I start, so the key to my structure is the date of death. Uh, uh, and I created, my years and years and years ago, I created a fact sheet uh, as a way of uh, starting to build up a profile of a burial ground. And each fact sheet goes into a folder, and I scribble, and anything at all, anything at all that I get, say on a particular individual, I will put in that folder. I just hold it. I scribble all over it, but it's there. And so for me, it's the date of death of an individual. Although uh, folders also contain deed documents, maps, all sorts of other information. But for, so the starting point is, if you're writing, and my view is have a structure that you can put your information into that you can understand and you can access very easily. So uh, this is it now. This I this was my very first fact sheet, and so the grave owned by. And you don't have to you know put all this information in at once. This uh, as you go through a cemetery, you will learn and you will pick up information and you'll get bits of information at different times and so the point is you start to build up a profile so the name, uh, location and cemetery one of the things that I always say to people and I say it here today is make sure your families when they're putting headstones up here put your date of birth the date of death everyone knows the date of death but the date of birth is often the hardest thing to find 
because if you find the date of birth, then you can start from the beginning, work through school, marriage, work, employment, all that follows. So a date of death is very uh, important, but the date of birth is also, when you're researching, is also crucial. The grave number, the type of stone, damage to the stone, the number in the grave, and inscriptions. But I use this, uh, so for every individual, and for every folder that I create, I have this uh, sheet. Uh, and it, sir, it guides me right through the information that I hold. So, a cemetery is a place for burials. Now, it's a place where we conceptualize death. I have a sense now, and, it, uh, and I'm slightly uh, non-religious in this sense, but I have a sense that human beings can't deal with death at their core. That death is nothingness. It's kaput. Therefore, what we do is we conceptualize it. And we conceptualize it to make it try and understand it. So we talk about, uh, it is, we're crossing the river. We're crossing the sticks. We're on the other side. And we also conceptualize it through a narrative of an individual, of an organization, uh, of the graveyard itself. Uh, through ritual, through stone. If you think about it, hundreds of thousands of years ago, some human being laid down a stone on a grave and in doing that started the whole process of connection to burials and in doing that they created a history because what they're saying the person here is important so therefore we're going to bury them in a spot and put a stone to mark it and in when they did that of course they then started to create art because they paint stones they put in shells and what sometimes we forget about death and the ritual of death it is probably the most common of all human experiences lived every day for thousands of years. And it's a, so when you see uh, in a burial ground, you in fact involve yourself in a process that is common to humanity for thousands and thousands of years. So stone inscription. Uh, inscriptions can tell you a particular time. So there's a stone in the city cemetery which talks about a soldier dying in Mesopotamia. We would know that today as Iraq and Iran. But this, so this tells us that the world is a different place. <coughs> Symbolism. It, it's how we conceptualize uh, death, and I'll talk about that. Architecture. Uh, and the layout of the cemetery. All of these provide their own narrative. So for me, it is not about saying such and such lived, uh, this is his life story. It's where does the story lead? And can we go off? Uh, and look at different, and I use his story, so if I'm looking at a soldier of the First World War, I write about the battle that he was involved in. So I go sideways, but all of it's, there is multiple stories to be told in a burial ground. Because, of course, people's lives reflect uh, multiple narratives. So this is a, I begin with the history of the cemetery. So I want to ground myself in this space. I want to have a sense that I know it that I know it so that I, that I have a map in my head. And so maps evolve for me is very important. Because of course, if I asked you, well, do you know where Marks and Sparks and Town is? Everybody knows. You have a map in your head. And what I try and do is replicate that map in relation to a burial ground. I want to know it uh, in all its detail. So I know where this person's buried, or where that stone is, or where you can find that bit of symbolism. And that requires me then uh, to begin a process. And this is really for, for the start of the process for me, uh, is to ask these questions. Who bought the land? What was the size of the cemetery when it opened? So Belfast City Cemetery started over 40 acres. Today it's 101 acres. How did that happen? Uh, has increased in size. How was the cemetery laid out? Uh, was it because when the cemeteries moved from being, say, church cemeteries or institutional cemeteries to being municipal cemeteries, often they were planned in detail. And it's that, uh, also that, of course, becomes the story of the cemetery. Uh, were there local newspaper reports of this? Uh, how were grave and sections referenced? Of course, when you have a grave reference, uh, and uh, we'll look at that later, then you begin to plot out uh, the, the layout of the cemetery. 
So when was the cemetery opened and what was its name? So the city cemetery was, when it opened, was the Belfast Cemetery in 1911 with the extension it becomes the Belfast City Cemetery. Uh, so the Balmoral Cemetery as we know today was the, uh, the Belfast Cemetery Malone when it opened. It changes its name and it's known by something else today. Was it formally opened and by whom? For instance, in a Catholic cemetery, was it blessed and how was it blessed? And what uh, form was the, uh, the blessing? What did it really cost? Uh, and what does it cost today? Uh, um, for instance, in the city cemetery again, there were six classes of grave. So the, the less you paid, the more you went into a section. So in the city cemetery, class and creed were built into the planning <coughs> of the cemetery. Were there different categories of grave? Were there different prices? Who was the first person buried in the cemetery? And are married, and many are buried today. These are just fundamental questions to uh, to to begin the interest, to uh, in a sense to lay the foundations for your knowledge, uh, because known a cemetery is known more than just the names of those who are buried there. So this is a, a nod on on October the newsletter on October the thirteenth, eighteen fifty five. And it says the Belfast Cemetery Malone is now open. And it gives the name of the Reverend Henry Cook, uh, the Reverend James Morrow, John Edgar, uh, James Kennedy, William Laird, and these are the trustees. The difficulty with this cemetery, by the end of, of that century, all of these people are dead. And that's part of the narrative too, uh, as it's taken over by a committee, but when there are moves to either sell it or get it given to the Belfast Corporation and then Belfast City Council, there's no trustee, so that becomes a, uh, a story in itself. This is a, the, the, it shows you this, uh, 204 feet at its frontage. This is a map uh, of the cemetery. Mr. Coates, I will tell you who owns the land along the line of the cemetery. Uh, so this then be actually begins to give you a sense when you have this detail, so you're bringing it in and you're storing it and you're, you're getting a better sense of the space. This is a deed document from 1855 and you'll find these documents uh, here in Prony. Uh, but this was used when, as you can see, uh, 1947. So there begins a process in 1947 of uh, their beginning to, they want Belfast Corporation to buy the cemetery. And it's eventually uh, sold because it's a legal process. You know, graves are a legal entity. We all know that. When you buy a grave, if you own a grave, it is a legal entity. It's, it's got its own legal status. So you just can't say, here, take the cemetery, and that's it. Uh, and it needs permission from, uh, in this case, uh, it was permission from the Minister of Home Affairs and the old storm government. But again, what it shows you here is it shows you the trustees. Uh, there's Henry Cook. Uh, there, there, I think James Morgan was a trustee. He was the minister and fisherman. Now, so this document contains a lot of detail about the size, about the intent, what the cemetery is about. It's all very legal, but these documents again provide you with the foundation of the early history of the cemetery. Now, what happened with uh, Balmoral and Hart came about, uh, Henry Cook and the Reverend Mackenzie were at a burial in the Church of Ireland, very ground we think, outside Drumbo, uh, and the Saxon came out and said they couldn't hold their service, the burial service, uh, as a Presbyterian service. So they then went uh, and bought a piece of land and decided we are going to create our own cemetery, in which they did. Uh, and one of the stipulations that they made was any persuasion could be buried in Balmoral. Now, you get a lot of Presbyterians in it, and a few Church of Ireland Methodists, I think even a few Catholics. Then events overtake it, if you think, it's open in 1859, uh, 1855, but by 1869 you have the new city cemetery on the Falls Road. Uh, but there's a lot of information in these documents. So it's really building a profile of its early history, because it has a story, and there's a story there to be told. So, this is a document, and it's dated 1925. There is an attempt 
to sell the cemetery or to have the cemetery taken over by uh, Belfast Corporation in 1925. By this state, it's, it's really this, uh, by 1925, the cemetery is in a very bad state. Uh, and so these are the minutes of, of the uh, Parks and Playgrounds Committee. You find these minutes in Prony, uh under Belfast Corporation. And again, there's a lot of information as you have correspondence back and forth from a number of individuals to Belfast Corporation. For instance, one of the things that uh, these reports contain is the state of the cemetery. So you're able to gauge uh, what has happened to the headstones, there's flooding in the cemetery, there's a lot of growth, and you get it all from this information. And while I, I suppose, construct uh, the books, uh, or at least the city cemetery and my Melton books in terms of tours, I always like to tell the story of the cemetery. Uh, and how it came about, and what are the conditions uh, of the time when the cemetery was created. And these documents are really essential reading. Uh, so, back to maps. For me, it is important that when I am um, dealing with the cemetery, it isn't just about getting information and writing it, and putting it down, and you know, just uh, creating. For me, the important thing is that I smell this space. I know it. So when you come and say to me, where's Henry Cook buried? Or where's the Reverend Hannah buried? Or where's John Edgar buried? Or where's Isabel Todd buried? I know precisely uh, where all these people are buried. That I, that I really get a sense of what a cemetery is and what it represents, whether it's in terms of the people who are buried there, or the type of stones, or Irish stone crosses, or Gothic design stones, or the different uh, architectural lines that you get in the cemetery. I want to know it all. And there's only one way in my view of doing that, and that is you walk this space. You walk it, and you walk it, and you walk it, until it's really a part of your DNA. Uh, and for me, so the first thing is, how do I get all of that as a map so that I, in my head, I can visualize that. And I can visualize the detail of that. So, this is what I start with. This is, uh, there was, this is the only, uh, there's another map that I had, no detail at all. Uh, they had uh, lost the, the map of this cemetery. And in fact, if you think about it, Belfast Corporation has a terrible track record, I get to say. They demolished uh, Shangle Road Cemetery. They lost the records. There's no records there. Uh, and when I, so when I started to look at the uh, records of City Cemetery, I found them in a basement in the City Hall where and the temperature was something like maybe 120 degrees. You went in the steam, you, you know, the sweat came out of you. And so I start, this is me starting from scratch uh, to try and understand what is the layout of, of this cemetery. So, and this is another uh, map that I had. I, I, I think it, it, there are, it, these are just surrounds because this is where Henry Cook's buried. John Edgar's buried down here. Uh, Han is over here. Uh, Rob is the, the, the stores over here. So I get to, I know where all the graves are now, but there's detail even missing in this. So, what was my first move? My first move is, this is a map of the cemetery that I created. Now, this is a cleaned up version. But for me, I would have taken the original map without any detail. So what I do is I list each section. I give it a numerical reference. And then I systematically, in sequence, photograph every headstone uh, in that section. And then what I do with the photographs is, uh, so I walk this site, uh, I develop on the internal map, I photograph key features, headstones, I look for inscriptions, <coughs> for symbolism, what is the architecture, uh, is there anything unusual about the stone, and all of that is love. And the other reason I photograph is this, the eye tells you lies. So, 
if you think of the name Gallagher, so Thomas Gallagher is G-A-L-L-A-H-E-R. So when I uh, spelled it first, it was G-A-L-L-A-G-H-E-R. The I assumed what the name was. Same with Irvin and Irvine. So when a photograph is really important of a headstone, because you can study it and you, you, you even see stuff that you can't see when you're just physically looking at a stone. And you can study it. And there's all great detail uh, on the older headstones uh, and that you can study and then incorporate into your narrative. And for instance, one of the things that uh, you find in old headstones is the, so the family name. So uh, it'll be uh, James Blog, Mary, Sarah uh, McKee. So you, you get all sorts of information uh, yeah, in, on a headstone. So this stone, I came across this stone in uh, Balmoral. It has no inscription. But it has a pouch and a sword and over here it's got RE, Royal Engineer. So, but I had no idea who this person was. So this is how I went uh, about finding out. First of all, there are gravestone inscriptions of Balmoral Cemetery. And you have them up Clifton Street and uh, Milltown, you have none of the city centre. <coughs> so I systematically looked through every page looking for uh, a description of that stone. And so I came across a white limestone pillar in which are carved the sword, belt and the pouch. And this is Hampton Clement Lamere Murray, a soldier. So here, uh, 10th of January 1821, he was born, and he died on the 27th of February 1869. So now I can place him. I know when he died, in fact I know when he was born, I know when he died, and I know what section he's buried in. So then the next thing I do is go to the burial register of Balmoral Cemetery, which is held here in Crony, and I look up the date of his death to find out is there a grave reference. And there is. He's buried in section A1. So then I go back to my photographs and Moody A124. This is his burial. This is his grave reference. Now here you can see I so anytime I come across an A1, it goes into this file. So I know for this whole, so I built up a profile of this section. What graves are missing? What is the sequence of numbering uh, on the section? What direction it goes in? Uh, how many graves are in that section? So I start to build up in this file a profile of A1. But I also do something else to make it, once I get the nose name, so I then put him in another file, alphabetically. So here he is here. So when the name comes up, without having to even go in and search uh, my hard drive, I know to go into this and see do I have a photograph of the stone. And um, it is easier in this entry because there's over 600 stones, and I photographed every one. So today I have a complete record <coughs> of existing stones. And that also tells you when you match it, with the gravestone inscriptions of stones that have disappeared. The other thing is that stones after 1900 aren't covered in the uh, gravestone inscriptions. So then that, so as I begin to uh, correlate all this information, I start to know the stones uh, or recent stones that are not included. Then this is my map. He's buried over here in A1. So I systematically, using every headstone, gravestone inscriptions, <laughs> start to build the profile of the cemetery. This didn't exist or was lost. And the first thing uh, it strikes you is that I always thought Presbyterians, I hope there's no Presbyterians here today, <laughs> I always thought they were a logical lot. <laughs> Let me try and explain this, Mark. 
<laughs> First of all, they used Roman numerals. Okay? So I've used, uh, as, the, uh, as I built up, uh, the Roman numerals. And you can see here, for instance, I've got a square and five. So there's a question mark. So look over here. This is square one, two, three, four, six, seven, and eight. There's no square five. Okay? H. So over here, uh, the G, H, I, there's no H. Okay? J, there's no J. There is R. I don't know what it means. I also came across this reference strangers ground. I think it's program, but I don't know where it is. There's no sense, because they wouldn't give a grave reference, they just say strangers ground. <coughs> but look, so A1 is here, okay? This is A1, this is A2. Then A3 is here, <laughs> A4 is over here. <laughs> I don't know where A5 is. So uh, this is A7 and A8. You, uh, look at R's. There's a K, 1K. There's an F down here. It really uh, uh, it takes an, uh, you know, one of these machines, coding machines, to work out <laughs> what exactly is going on. It's, what I was looking for is a pattern of, of uh, in, in relation to... Uh, the layout of this cemetery, and it's very confusing. So this is again the map, but so what I've done here, I've color-coded uh, to try and make sense so that I understand. So the A's are along the main path, B's one in. Uh, you see it here, there's D after B, okay. There's a G over here. Uh, again, there's C over here. It's very confusing. And not all of this, of course, as I try to uh, make sense of this map, what essentially I'm doing is learning about this burial ground. I'm, every time I'm trying to get a sense of where it is, how it's shaped, how it's designed, how it's sections laid out, uh, and all of this helps me do that. So this is the, uh, the cleaned up version of the map. Uh, and you can see it here, so uh, entrance to Stockman's Lane, Stockman's Lane over here is the railway line, Lisburn Road, so, yes. so all of this is about, so this then becomes, you might say, the legacy. Mm -hmm. Even but this, I arrived at this before I started to write about the book. Because this is me uh, having reached the point of understanding uh, what this cemetery was, how it was laid out, the stones in it, uh, how I referenced it, how I had stones were referenced, all this information. This, is, this for me is essential. This is me grounding myself in the history of, of this cemetery. And this is what, this is how you, uh, so a room number, this is DV, uh, and then this is, this is DV8, D8. Uh, on uh, grade of 10. So it's easy to understand once you've gone through all of that. So I want to talk about the individuals and the key, what I start to, uh, how I start to build a profile of individuals. Census and all this information you'll get here in Crony. Census records, very good, particularly in 1901 and 1911. If you're dealing with the end, uh, of the 19th century. There's a lot of information. Street directories. I found street directories in Bollywood. In here they've got street directories from 1900. They have a better selection over in the central life. Uh, and why it doesn't exactly tell you when a family arrived, but you can begin to see uh, the family arrives at a particular uh, address and then leaves in a particular year, but it gives you a sense of movement. Uh, and of course, street directories are both in terms of streets and also names. So you can look up a name to see how you're related to a street. I found them invaluable uh, when you're looking for individuals. Uh, the extent in burial records, and I built a city council, 
has a very good uh, burial record, and they've got burial orders. The old burial orders in Belfast City Council will tell you what someone died from. So uh, if you begin to look at uh, how people died, you begin to get, build a profile of uh, what killed them and, uh, and how it came and what time of the year a particular disease arrived. So when I was researching a Spanish lady flu, you could see a, a, a peak in the burial records of this period. Uh, ownership of grave is very important uh, because graves are a, a legal entity. So what family owns them? And of course, if you, if your family, uh, if you own a, say, a grave, but it's not in your name, you can have it changed, but it needs to be changed legally. Death notices, uh, sometimes in the area, it's very difficult to find them. Obituaries, uh, often tell you more information that you'll find in the formal biographies of people. You'll get a lot of information in obituaries. So to try and, you know, records in terms of birth, where were they born, it's all, for me that's important. It's because it's the start of someone's life. School, what school did they go to? What is the level of their education? Employment, who did they marry? Their family. All of this really, uh, and this is for me the joy. And you know, I would search for months on end for a nugget that brings a whole narrative together. I would search for it and search for it and search for it. But that's the joy of I think of this type of work. Then, so this is a headstone of Samuel Young. And Samuel Young was, I still think he holds a record, the oldest MP in the British House of Commons. He was 96 when he died. He was born in 1822. He uh, was a nationalist. And when he uh, died, his seat went to, in a bad election, to Arthur Griffith of Sinn Féin. He made whiskey. And uh, as I said, he, uh, in the split, uh, due to the Parnell scandal, he took the side of the anti-Parnell. So, so, in a sense, I was a bit surprised to find him uh, in Balmoral. So, but look at this. He was born on the 26th of February, 1822. I want to show you something. So, this is my file on him. So, I came across this. He has avenged the wrongs of Ireland by selling so much of his whiskey to thirsty Englishmen. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just, I scribbled up there. Uh, he's in the National uh, Liberal Club in London. And you can see here, uh, entered the House of Commons in 1892 and died in 1918. But look at his date of death is the 26th, sorry, his date of birth is again the 26th of February. So I write everything, scribble it down. I, it's, you come across a lot of information when you're researching it. Try not to lose it. Find a way, you might find a bank of ideas or you might create a, a file for information that you don't use, but maybe later on, you can't use it. So, he's born on the 26th of February, 1822. This is, a, a, again, an obituary. Uh, it's in the Belfast newsletter. So always make sure when you're either photocopying a newsletter, a paper, always to write the date and the name of the paper. <laughs> you know, because uh, sometimes you don't get the name. We simple things that allow you to go back and trace uh, <coughs> and keep a track of what's happening. This is a uh, 1911 census open. Here he is here. Now, the one thing I like about the 1911 census is it tells you the number of children and the number of who died. So there's information, and of course it'll tell you this is his daughter. Uh, so there's always, you get some information, nugget of information in these records. So what it is about is recognizing that there, there is at hand you know, ways of starting to look at someone's life before you start to really a deep analysis of, you know, and really hunting out you can, where they lived, you know, the census records. It starts to give you information. Now, this is a biography of them. The real lesson here, 14th of February, 1822. The lesson is, don't ever trust, this is one of these biographies, don't ever trust the information that you see. Find out yourself, is the information correct? Because of course people make mistakes, particularly safety enough on headstones. But, uh, so always check and double check. 
Uh, I, I, of course, always go with the information on the headstone. Uh, but this is quite common of people, you know, mistake being, and it then comes right through uh, all the different uh, references to this individual. So what is the range of inform uh, information available? So this is the, the stone of John Edgar, Reverend John Edgar. John Edgar was alive today. He'd be building skyscrapers in London. Because he, when you read his life story, he's such a dynamic man. So he uh, started off commercial court in Belfast, then moved to Alfred Street, built two churches there, becomes a professor, and when he's a professor, he has to leave his congregation. But at the end, he buys an old Baptist church in Academy Street, and three congregations come out of it. He also bought the land, or got the land, for the Presbyterian College behind Queens. A really when you look at him, he is a driver. And I think, for me, uh, he re represents the dynamic nature of Presbyterianism in Belfast in the 19th century. And uh, so he started me on a journey. And this is the other thing about, I think, when you're writing a book, you have to let, in my view, the book lead you. It's an odd thing. So where you start and where you end up can be two different spaces. And you have to have the confidence, I think, uh, to go in a direction that you didn't plan, as information uh, becomes available, and the narrative leads you. And so, what he started to do, when I started to look at his life, I said, where were his churches? And, uh, so back to maps. Another map, this is an early map in Belfast, Bay Street. This is his two churches in Oxford Street. But then I noticed, of course, this is the White Linen Hall. Then I noticed the Presbyterian Church in Linden Hall Street and the Cobb and Notton Church. Now, if you think of Linden Hall Street today, this would be the back of the BBC. So this uh, congregation started in 1808, and uh, they uh, then moved to uh, Tony. It's the third church in Tony is now a uh, nightclub. And this is Lynn Hall Street congregation. Uh, they moved uh, to the Crescent. In, uh, and then the Crescent, uh, they, the Crescent congregation ceased to exist uh, and was bought by the, uh, another group. Fitz, uh, they, go to, they moved to Fitzroy. So what started to involve my mind? So I'm a Falls Road man and I have no sense of what's taking place. Because I suspect in the Catholic tradition, the, uh, the people follow the church. But then what struck me was that as Presbyterians, it, it is the buildings following the people. And you see, so this starts an outward movement out of the centre of Belfast and Presbyterians. So I started to log, because I had no sense, absolutely no sense, of the extent of the development of the Presbyterian church and uh, Belfast in the 19th century. So I started to log all these churches. And it's very confusing, because, for instance, Barry Street, which is one of the oldest congregations in Belfast, they, they uh, created four congregations out of Barry Street. Uh, Academy Street, three congregations. So, and every time a congregation moved, it changed its name. So it didn't uh, maintain its name, so, uh, this congregation is, uh, started off as First Barry Street, so it moved to Lynn Hall Street and becomes Lynn Hall Street, and then it moves to the Crescent and becomes the Crescent. Mm -hmm. So I started to track the development of all these buildings. And one of the things then I find is that Presbyterians are prodigious builders in the 19th century. They build something, they create about 66 congregations <coughs> in Belfast. They build over 100 churches. They're prodigious. Uh, and uh, so I started to try, in a way I had no intention when I started to write a book on Balmoral Cemetery to talk about this narrative. But it's such a, it is such a dynamic narrative. Uh, by the way, this is St. Paper Mill, this is Joy, you know Henry Joy? Mm -hmm. This is his paper mill, you know down the end of the Maps, I think, maps tell you so much. I can do without maps. Even the way 
uh, an area changes, streets come, streets go, how a city changes. Uh, it tells you so much about the, uh, what you're looking for. So, this is Alfred Street Church. Um, one of the things is, if you look at these churches, and then Hall Street, Fisherwick was the same, they're all this classical architecture. And I'm wondering, is this a hard Belfast gets the term <coughs> Athens of the North? In that, it's classical architecture, and there's so many of these uh, Presbyterian churches. So this is Alfred Street. Of course, I said they moved to Fitzroy. So this is where I start to love. So from 1645 to 1791, I love 13 congregations. But I'm a bit confused because a congregation doesn't always represent a building. And congregations, when a congregation begins and when a church is built, because often what you would find is that particularly in the early city congregations like Alfred Street begins commercial port and eventually moves to a small church in Alfred Street. So they, they'd be in existence in the area before they actually start to build their church. So then I start to put them, uh, you know, so here, 1839, 18, see, 1850, 59, two big periods of growth, it, after 1859 and the revival, and then in the 1890s, as I think they, what has happened is, uh, there is a sense of they're moving into working class communities. So, and this is another form, again, you can see me scribbling, uh, I'm trying to figure out how many of these churches that were, so here Townsend Street, so see in brackets too, that means they, Townsend Street, they have two churches, they built two churches. Uh, I think well, there's up here three churches, uh, there's, they're prodigious builders. And so I had to try to track all of this. But one of the ways, and I think if you're putting information in this form, a simple thing, a simple mechanism of tracking it, uh, because, you know, when you start, you, you end up with, I may end up with two dozen of these as I work through the detail. But just put draft one, draft two, so that you know in sequence how your information is being developed. And then, I went and made my own map. To see, so this is a map of Presbyterian congregations in the centre of Belfast. So this is, uh, to, this was the first uh, administrative building we know today as Ross's Auction House. If you ever pass Ross's Auction House and look up at the pediment and you'll see the burning bush. Uh, this is Cook's Old Church, uh, May Street. These are the two churches in Alfred Street. Here there's two churches. These are gone. That's moved. Uh, this is Lynn Hall Street, they're gone. Fisherwick, of course, moved to Fisherwick on the Malone Road. And uh, church house was built there. This was a reformed Presbyterian church on the Grabner Road. Uh, it's gone. This is Barry Street, which congregation ceased to exist in 2016. There were three churches in Rosemary Street. First church, it's the oldest uh, congregation in Belfast. It's still in existence. Second Rosemary moved to All Souls in Elmwood Avenue. But I have a photograph taken in the 1960s and you can still see the form of Second Rosemary. Uh, this third Rosemary, we lost that during the Blitz. Donegal Street, uh, it, uh, there's they built two. It's gone. Academy Street's gone. This is a uh, non subscribing Over here, you've got Great George Street. This is where the uh, the revival came to Belfast, uh, there was a minister called the Reverend Toy. So, uh, and over here, you've got College Square North. It was closed in the 1960s. So today, you've got May Street. And uh, now, um, of these, there's May Street and First Rosemary. And Barry Street is still in existence. I tracked from the end of the 1960s, uh, to the present, 25 uh, Presbyterian congregations uh, ceased to exist in Belfast. And of those, uh, we've lost over half of the buildings associated with those <coughs> congregations. 
And my theory is, if you can't see them, you can't hear them. And it's important. So we're losing... And, and, uh, so these congregations have disappeared, and we don't see them. Uh, so in the 19th century, I think there were 66 congregations, over 100 churches. And that's non-subscribing, covenanters, seceders. This is Hugh Hunter, Rowan Hunter. Dynamic man. He, uh, he was minister of Barry Street, and he rebuilt Barry Street. Then, of course, he built one of the biggest Presbyterian churches in Belfast, and he mixed a Carlisle service, which was burnt down in 1985. Uh, of course, he is often referred to as Rowan Hunter, and he's very much seen uh, in political terms. But when I was studying his uh, life, the odd thing about him is this, he built six schools. This man built six schools. And that then started me on another track of, <laughs> you know, Presbyterians and education. Colin believed that education should be open to all. Obviously, if, there, if you're going to read the Bible and you're going to read it in the vernacular, then you've got to be able to read. So education was central to how Presbyterians saw their role in the world. Um, Knox, of course, knew Calvin. Knox brings this Presbyterian view of education to uh, Belfast. And of course, in Belfast you have uh, the Royal Belfast Academy, started at the end of the 18th century. Inst, uh, Victoria College, started by Margaret Barrett. Margaret Barrett was a member of the congregation on Dublin Road. And then I started to track the schools that Presbyterians had opened in Belfast. And for me, it's such a wonderful idea that they opened nearly as many schools as they built churches. I track over 80 schools. And of course, this feeds an industrial, a literate this, uh, community feeds an industrial channel. But I think it's such a beautiful idea. And we don't often, I think today, we don't associate uh, you know, Presbyterians with this drive and providing an education. <laughs> uh, and we see it uh, in our schools, and of course many of these schools again have disappeared. Uh, so that's another part of the book, as I tried to get a sense of their dynamic growth in the 19th century, and started by uh, evolving Hugh Hanna. So I want to talk now about uh, information, and how it isn't just a matter of knowing about a burial ground. It is about knowing about its environment, uh, and maps tell you how an environment changes. So this is the Falls Road. This is in 1830s, one of the first Ordnance Survey maps. And this is the site of the what we know today as the city cemetery. What you will notice, for a start, is that it's called the new line of the road. And I think roughly this line would come down, this would be the main avenue of the Belfast City Cemetery. Over here, you've got an Irish uh, round fort, and here's another one here. So when you look at a broader map of the area, it tells you this is an ancient landscape, and this is what it looked like. Milltown, this is this become Milltown House. This becomes the back of the cemetery when uh, the city cemetery uh, is opened. So, I think studying maps are so vitally important. This is an aerial photograph, again, this is me getting a sense of the uh, society. Here's the Falls Park. As a kid, I, this is what we call the pruder. It was a swimming pool. Uh, over here, look, this is taken in 1967, and you can still see the footprint of an Irish round fort. And I have a great photograph of a British Army fort sitting on top of the <laughs> Irish Red <Rebels> Fort. <laughs> here you have the new estate of Colin Murphy, Turf Lodge here. Uh, and you can see stuff that has disappeared, you know, the uh, tennis courts and what have you. Uh, the cemetery, you can really see it here. So uh, when it's designed, it's designed like a bell. So look at the bell here. See it? Uh, and so uh, here's select positions. So there's so much. This is me getting to know 
uh, about the history uh, uh, of this site. And this is my map of it. And this is its history. So here you have the bell, the Jewish burial ground, the poor ground. This is a later, this is opened in 1911 called Glen Molina. When this cemetery was opened first, it was meant to be interdenominational. So the Protestants were meant to come in this gate, Catholics this gate, the poor uh, were over here. Uh, they, had, they had their own uh, entrance. Out of, they were always put at the back of the cemetery. Uh, out of sight, out of mind. This is the Jewish burial ground. Uh, here you have a bit of poor ground, and that's ground that was never used. So for me, it's always leaving, you know, the information that is easily understood that tells the history of the site. This is a map of the Jewish burial ground. This first section here, this used to be a small called Tahara. Vandalized, disappeared. These are the first graves, German Jews. Uh, and then this 1884 poor ground. And then what you begin to see from 1904, they start to use the stones. and So they're settled as a community. Uh, they're established. They can afford headstones. And then this, the last grave is in 1964. When this cemetery, when they asked for this ground, uh, they were told, you've got to build a wall. And I think, again, tell the story that this is a Jewish burial ground. So they didn't want the Jews and the Christians to be looking at one another. So they were told, you can have a bit of land, uh, but you need to build a wall. I'm just going to go back. Um, When the cemetery is open, I'm going to show you it in a second, you can see here this dividing line. So this was meant to be for the Catholics of Belfast, and they were meant to have an orgy chapel here. But the dispute arose with the cemetery and the bishop, and it was about Catholic moral teaching. That is, a stillborn child could not be buried in Catholic blessed ground, nor could someone who uh, had committed suicide, or someone who was excommunicated, and the last category I was saying of someone who bought a grave as a Catholic and then became a Protestant. And as I said, that I voiced the back of the crowd like, God forbid. <laughs> Would that be? And so, they built a wall here. And uh, this is Milltown. So Milltown is really, it's this, so this is the first 15 acres on the 21st of the 11th. Then uh, 1869, 1928, 1906, 1933, and 1965. All these are periods of development uh, that are really about the narrative of the story. This is what a section uh, in the uh, city cemetery, and sorry, a milltown looks like. And you can see it's grave on grave. So it's very difficult. You can't, I mean, it's very difficult. If, if you're own a grave in the middle and there's a burial, you have to walk over graves. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so when I was uh, looking at Milltown, uh, the Redemptists have a plot in Milltown, but the first forty Redemptists in Belfast are buried under the crypt of Connor Monastery. So that allows me to go sideways, and this is a map of the crypt of Connor Monastery. So again, it's uh, about the historical record. So here is the crypt, and here who's buried in it. Uh, the first burials are all priests. And when you notice the pattern, the brothers who uh, were separated, the brothers weren't buried with the priest. Although later on they were. And then uh, I came across a story. The, and the, the nuns of the Dominican College on the Falls Roads in Dominic, they were first buried in uh, Milltown. But then they opened their own burial ground in St. Dominic's, opposite Royal Victoria Hospital. And they reinterred, there were four nuns, I think, reinterred there. And uh, so today there's a small burial ground. And so I, I made a map of all of that. So again, it's a history, but it's going sideways a bit to give you a sense of uh, other histories and that uh, you see in Belfast. This, nobody ever believes it, but this is a very small section of the underground wall dividing the uh, Catholic worms from the Protestant worms. <laughs> <laughs> it runs to the length of a section. It is the depth of a grave. And it deserves separate the Catholic blessed ground from the rest of the cemetery. 
It is still there to this day. Uh, again, you can see the Latin. I am the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Uh, it's, it's the last line of the credo. And this is over the gate of Milltown Cemetery. But the other thing you notice here, here and here, this gate is unfinished. So there meant to be angels here uh, on a religious scene up here. Never completed. So you find all sorts of uh, facts that you can bec that becomes a part of your narrative. For me, this is one of the most beautiful pieces of artwork and also funerary architecture. This is built in. For me, why? Because the face, you know that sense of father, father, why hast thou forsaken? That someone has the talent in their fingers to put that in stone. But then this is the son of a man called Bert, very rich Catholic. I remember the very small Catholic middle class. But this stone was made in Paris and brought to Milltown Cemetery. This is Valentine Mumby McMaster, born in Bombay, or Mumbai. And he's got a Victoria Cross. And he's uh, 78 Seaforth Highlanders, <coughs> and he received the, uh, the VC. But Monby, we don't know if it's his mother's name, which was Monby, or is it a nickname because he was born in Mumbai? <laughs> and in the burial record, it's Murdy McMaster. And one of the things you find when you're dealing with headstones is the mistakes. So, you know, the children know the name and they make a mistake. Well, they can't sort of rub it out here. <laughs> so you come across, it's amazing the mistakes you come across uh, on headstones. This is Francis McGinn. Francis is a young man. He took out, and as a result, he went dead. And his parents uh, brought him to uh, Santa Fe, the United States. And um, what Francis did, he learned sign language in the United States and then brought it back to Ireland. This is F, and this is A. So, see the symbolism? So, you all so here I was able to tell the story of uh, Francis and uh, sign language in Ireland. And oddly enough, there's Irish sign language and English sign language. Uh, and so, you never really know where a grave's going to lead you. This is a stone of a number of children, might be one month. 11 and a half months, 4 and a half, 7 months, 18 months, 7 years, and 6 months. This stone tells you of the vulnerability of children in the 19th century. Now, this is close to us. If you think about it, this is our parents. Our parents knew about this. And you see it when you go back to the, uh, when you go back to the uh, census records, you'll see the number. It was so common. So this allowed me to get a health report of the city of Belfast in the years, I think it's 1895 that Louise died. And there was a health report uh, in a five week period for July that year. And in a five week period, over 370 children in this city died. And that's over 10 a day. We tend to think uh, the death of a child is extraordinary. But in fact, and this is, you know, my parents, you know, uh, and you have the conditions that, you know, they only really eradicated by the 1950s, if you think about the kids and the small bottles of milk and all the pipes and what have you. But this, this is so close to us. And it's a reminder. The other thing that I found about children, when I was looking at the records in the city cemetery, is you would see newborn child found in Springfield Dam, newborn baby. You could do... A, uh, a, a, you could plot out the rivers and the dams of Belfast. Now, it's not on every page, but it's right. And it tells you about the social pressure. Maybe a young woman, a young girl gets pregnant. Uh, or is it poverty? What are the conditions that drive uh, a woman or a family to drown the baby? And it's, it, it's, it's right. And it tells you again about the pressure uh, of society at the time. This is St. Martin's Cross. This cross brought me on a pilgrimage 
because St. Martin, this is a half replica of St. Martin's Cross on Iona. And if you're ever on the island of Iona, you'll see a full-size St. Martin's Cross. And there's so much. The bean it bring is very typical of the, the Copts, you know, the, the North African uh, Christians. And this cross, St. Martin was a cop. And here you see a mother and child. Uh, and of course, the sheep and the donkeys. Have you noticed up here that this donkey has a cross on its tail? This is uh, Daniel in the lion's den, uh, Abraham and Isaac, <coughs> David playing the harp on the original uh, a paper, four representations of David, and here you have snakes eating their own tails. Now, when the Christians came to Ireland, what they did is they appropriated religious beliefs of those who live on this island before Christianity. So we think of the snake as the devil, but older uh, civilizations thought of the snake as regeneration, new life, because the snake gets rid of the skin. And so uh, this is snakes eating their own tails. And you'll find on this 8th century stone cross on Iona, you'll see this. And so therefore that brought me into uh, the symbolism of crosses. This is an earlier version, so the arms are quite short. The ring, we think, is a representation of the sun. Uh, and often they're on a, you'll see a large stone, we think, representing Golgotha, the stone of Calvary. So this then brings me into the whole history of Irish stone crosses, so you can write about uh, their representation and why uh, they're so important in this island. And the best, you know, in this city, the best collection of Irish stone crosses you'll find are in Belfast City Cemetery. So that's another, you know, people might think it might, uh, you might get them in Milltown, but in fact, the Irish stone crosses in the city cemetery or something else. This is a Herdman's, Herdman's Sand Mills, Herdman's Tunnel in Belfast. Now, this is called Egyptian Revivalist because it's designed like a gate or a door of an Egyptian temple. You can't see it so well here, but up here you'll have a double-headed falcon in a disc. This is a Corinthian column. If you notice the inverted torches, the torch upside down should not have the, uh, the, uh, the oxygen to be lit, so it's eternal life. This is a cosmos flower. But over here, you've got a cross, and this cross set me thinking. So it's a Templar cross, so I immediately thought Masonic. So the double-headed falcon is the symbol of a 33rd degree Prince Mason in the ancient Scottish Rite. Uh, the Templar cross uh, is a Templar, Knight's Templar. The Corinthian column is a Masonic symbol of beauty. There are five sets of four rings, and I think a representation of Jacob's letter. This is the octagon, the eight pointed star. Now, around here, this is called a torus or a surround. If you take this as one brick, and where they meet as one brick, uh, there are 33 of them around the stone. So there are two layers of uh, symbolism here, uh, and one is uh, Egyptian revivalist, and the other, of course, is Masonic. So again, that's the joy of, of, of a burial ground. You never quite know what you're going to find, on so many different directions that they lead you in. A bit of humour. This is Jared Duffy from Gorfman Street. I told you that I was sick. <laughs> now, that allowed me to tell the story of Spike Milligan. Because Spike Milligan wanted that on his headstone. We have it first in the But Spike Milligan wanted that. He's buried in London. But the authorities there wouldn't allow him to put that on his headstone. So what did he do? He, his headstone is in Irish with this in Irish. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to tell them the story about Spike Milligan. And I told you I'm sick. <laughs> so there's another one, uh, Stone, Beam Me Up Lord, obviously a Star Trek fan. <laughs> so, just to finish, because what I've tried to do is to talk about the collection of information. Writing is an exercise, so you get better with practice. It's not meant to be easy. You know, so for some it is, but I think it's, you just have to keep on it. 
find the rhythm in your own words. I think there's music in the way, uh, so you need to find that rhythm when you're right. Uh, follow the narrative, because it's going to lead you in directions that you didn't foresee. Because there's, it's, it's, it, essentially it is a story of human beings and all uh, their complexity. And it leads you in ways, and I think you need the confidence. If you go in with a fixed idea, you know, you're going to lose so much. So, you know, uh, follow the narrative. You have to edit your work over and over. And I always tell the story, I, uh, I come from a family, my dear wife also is an author. And sometimes I write a big juicy sentence, and I love it. I think this is brilliant. Yeah, how, how can anyone construct such a brain sentence? <laughs> and of course, she look at it and say, it's superfluous, get rid of it. <laughs> and then I be traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> So, when you start liking your own sentences, be aware. <laughs> you're not meant to. You're meant to try. And the other thing is this, at some point you need to let go. Because uh, you, you need to walk away from it, because you get word blind, at least I do. See, after a while, you get word blindness. When you, and also, what I find is your subject becomes the most boring subject in the world. <laughs> if only because you've read it, and reread it, and reread it. At the end of all, give it to two or three people. Get others to read it, because they will see things that you don't even imagine, <clears throat> that are that you have assumed. Because the the worst thing you can do is assume that your reader knows what you're writing about. And so you, uh, and when you change the document, designate the draft. So you're going to get a lot of information. So track it by saying draft one. It's a very simple mechanism, but it means then you can track the changes. So there you are. I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you very much.